I'm going to read one more from this chapbook. The uh, mathematician mentioned in this poem, Schauder was uh, killed by, he was shot and killed by the Nazis in 1943 when uh, trying to escape during a transport. But this, the poem takes place before he's killed. And it's called Numb. It is as if Schauder's chest is turning to rock, hardening against the spasms in his heart. They are twitches of love. Bannock has spoken to him of whom he must love over sausage sandwiches and beetroot soup and doodles of mathematics in the Scottish cafe. And so of course he loves his libido, an obedient puppy. He would fetch anything everything for Bannock, and now for his new bride, who is dark and delicate, who is even prettier than the Volca Hills on the edge of Lvov. But he feels a foreboding. Germany is worsening, but Germany is far enough away. It must be the flu, like the congestion from an unresolved proof clogging his ears, his throat, fevering his blood, and this winter, there is the prediction of a particularly chest numbing chill, which years later, Schauder will look back upon in wonder at how he was so blinded as to think it might, as in ordinary times, last merely a few months. I thought that had some resonance, resonance for the kind of situation we're in now different situation, but the idea that it's going to be over quickly. So this, I want to show you this. This is the cover of a chapbook that was published by Milk and Cake Press. And many, the poems in this chapbook are in, also in Dead Shark on the end train, but they were in this, um, this vehicle originally, and I'm going to read two of these. These are poems based upon the dioramas of Frances Glessner Lee. Some think of her as the mother of modern forensics. She created these crime scene models, which are still being used to, to train crime scene investigators. There were little dollhouses, and I will show you a um, photograph of her. This is her working at her table, making these little tiny uh, figures. She, they, they were basically dollhouses with dead bodies in them. Frequenting autopsies to verify the accuracy of her models, Glessner Lee notes the correct amount of bloating among those in her down at heel home, homes and rooms, victims led astray by desire and vice. The inherent vice of materials, degradation over time. Nail polish depicting blood turns purple. She paints dolls, newspapers stuffed into cracks and crushed cigarettes, knits stockings with needles the size of straight pins. Three crime scenes a year, each as costly as a basic house, not like her house, genteel, full of antiques, or the one in Santa Barbara to which she sent after her divorce, eight years is enough, to wallow in disgrace. She feels freed instead, obsessed, she writes, this has been a lonely and rather terrifying life I have lived. I want to show you one of the dioramas. And this is the poem inspired by it. This is called Small Caliber. See the body is at the bottom. Where are you going with a 22 in your hand, showing off your second amendment, shooting off your mouth, shooting her struck dumb in the chest, struck dumb boy. He struck her shooting upward from the street, anonymous shot. She on a chair, still in her apron and hairnet, hanging the weekly wash on the two-story porch, body falling Sunday morning. Husband drunk and cantankerous, he could have done it, loose with his hands. He too owns a 22 and a swagger. So this is uh, the cover of Dead Shark on the end train which is just out this month. And I'm going to start with the 
title poem, just off the screen share. The, the themes that run through this collection are objectification, love, violence, both implicit and explicit kinds of things I tend to write about. And this is the title poem, Dead Shark on the End Train. Poor brown fish beached at Coney Island, then carried in someone's arms to the roller coaster, where another man thought it beautiful and tried to transport it home, only to abandon it on the subway. And you know how it is in New York City, nothing surprises anyone. The car reeked of dead shark and passengers took photos debating Instagram filters when the conductor asked everyone to leave and closed off that train. At the end of the line in Queens, a transit worker plastic bagged the body and normalized the car. I fled Queens when I grew up like sharks that migrate freely. I traveled to survive, didn't want to reach the end of my line in the same place I started out from, though I ended up just on the other side of the river. When someone on the number one had a heart attack and died, his corpse rode the loop from South Ferry to the Bronx and back to South Ferry twice. Like a man in his habitat, he seemed to be napping. Unlike the shark, no one put a Metro card under his fin, cigarette in his jaws, can of Red Bull by his side for the journey. I want to thank Jennifer Franklin, by the way, for writing a wonderful blurb for the back cover of this book. This is a poem inspired by the death of a friend of mine called Two Girls, One Removed. After I phone to say I'm concerned you're wasting your life with deficient roam and adventure, you poo poo me, I mind my own business, and we both grow teeth in our vaginas, thus dress our lust to eat men alive. You go the tight clothes and thigh high boots route, I dye my hair red, wear fishnet hose. Lucky to be born later, we escape lobotomies homes for wayward girls, electric shocks. We curl up on the couch to study adults for more clues on how to be temptress, bitch, witch. The race is on to turn men into pigs. You go for the married ones, those who might have gotten you drowned or burned quicker. I quiet down, firm up, figure out when to keep mouth and legs shut and when to open them. In the end, we carry blame, remain victims of our aspirations. We rue reaching a time when they hardly matter. Like the hundredth song in last year's top 100, anything we try is ignored. On the way to our Waterloo, your cold coda wishes down like an impossible dagger. I chose to read this one because it mentions Jennifer's pretty much favorite person who's not a member of her household, and that's Beckett. And this is Femme Egorge, woman with her throat cut, which is the name of a, a, a sculpture by Giacometti. His decade of sex and death, the woman with her throat slit, a small nick in the carotid, her tiny head reaching for air as if bronze can gasp. Venus flytrap woman, spiky ribbed cockroach woman, convulsing disemboweled. I have destroyed her, Giacometti said, of busts of his wife, Annette. Serial expression of anger and guilt. He was better with hookers, the ultimate in womanhood, like his art, endless repetition. It was the usual good girl, whore dichotomy. As in his obsession, the prostitute Caroline, who stubbed out a cigarette on her portrait's well-placed bones, its jittery paint. Fail better, his friend Beckett wrote, fascination with the neck skeletal woman without pedestal, infertile man, quasi-impotent, someone brutal in the vicinity, that crucial gaze. I'm going to just, I'm going to read two more. 
pretty short. This is called Walking Home. The girl walking home alone doesn't know what to do about the stranger who calls her name. He claims he has a gun. His knowing her name is a gun. He blocks her way. Rail track, chain link fence, no parking sign. It's like that test she had in school yesterday, having to choose which animal doesn't belong. She guessed it was the cow. On her left, the empty tennis club. In front, the man who snarls, he will kill her. Let me see the gun in her piccolo voice. A train rushes by, if she were in it, her life would be different. The world is full of noise. Weeds, cigarette butts, rusted car, locked shed. She runs. She doesn't know if he can keep up. He's tall to catch her. He screams again, I'll kill her. I'll kill you. He does, she doesn't look back. And last one is sign. This is the last poem in the book, too. Remember Nim Chimsky? in his red knit sweater, the chimpanzee that thought he was human learned to sign stone when he wanted to smoke a joint. Not made for complex language, later he lived alone, sad and immobile inside a pen. He asked for beer and oranges. Give orange me, give eat orange me, eat orange, give me eat orange, give me you. You may be going blind, my doctor's words bite me, yellow deposits of druzen in the eye, and I rush to order the nutrients he claims are my only hope, capsules too big to swallow. I shuffle between writing directives for when I am dead and wanting to bonfire the papers. If I were a pine, my rough barked arms would stretch toward the sun. I wouldn't worry about eyes or words. They're selling pods now to grow death's ashes into trees. Give capsule me, give swallow capsule me, swallow capsule give me, swallow capsule give me you. Thank you. Thank you so much for that wonderful reading, Susanna. And Lynn McGee will read next. She lives in New York City. Her full-length co poetry collections include Tracks, Broadstone Books, 2019, and Sober Cooking, Spite and Dival Press, 2016. She is the author of two award-winning poetry chapbooks, Heirloom Bulldog from Bright Hills Press, 2015, and her first collection, Bonanza, Slapping Hall Press, 1996. Starting over in Sunset Park, a children's book co-written with Jose Palaus and illustrated by Bianca Diaz is forthcoming in fall 2020 from Tilbury Press and will be distributed by Norton. With Jerry La Femina for many years, she has curated the Lunar Walk Poetry Series. She serves on the Slapping Hall Press Advisory Committee. From the beginning, Lynn has amassed a startling compendium of sensuous lyrical poems on loss and love. As Carol Simmons all, all said about her SHP chapbook, Bonanza is a collection of poems which lives up to its title, a rich vein mined by an observer poet as intelligent as she is watchful. Forming an explicit narrative, the poems offer richly textured observations canny uses of the free verse line and a clear poetic voice traveling through time, geography, and the families we choose as well as those we inherit. Let's welcome Lynn. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Um, I just wanna say that I, like Susanna, I won the Slappering Hall Press chapbook contest before she did. I knew S Susanna's book, uh, the, in the, the Scottish Cafe, before I knew Susanna. Bonanza won the uh, contest in 1996. I didn't know who, you know, what Slapperine Hall Press was. I saw an, a little ad in Poets and Writers. I came home and there was a message on my answering machine, that's how long ago it was, um, that I had won. So I'm gonna read, this is the book. And I'm just gonna read one, one poem from that. It's called um, Twins. I wish you had stayed in that town where I followed, found your room, wore your clothes, and learned your jokes. I carry that photo of you balanced on the wing of a hyper cub, stooping with the weight of your parachute, arms out for balance, your face not full of daring as I expected, 
At my wedding, you leapt through the camera's flash, blocking my pose, balletic, out of sync. I was first to leave home, but you ran off one night at a time, dropping from our second story window, radio bulging from your hip pocket, freedom a silent swinging gait, a boy whose hands reeked of gasoline and marijuana, the wet lawn, white in moonlight. You let a girl with a black eye sleep against you at the airport, and you let me steal your friends. You arched your back across a pool table, gray eyes level with green velvet, aiming your stick and stroking it across your finger, women in golf shirts vying to light your cigarette and lose their bets, and that bar where I told you to meet me, hoping they'd unnerve you, happy when they didn't. We used to spin each other, work up speed, and let go. One would watch and one would fly. One slammed into slate and was yanked off the floor, flattened on the kitchen counter, skull wrenched under water, red and sucking down the drain. They lathered her hair while they were at it. I say it was you. You say it was me. Um, I also won this, uh, this is a little chapbook. Um, it's a Bright Hill Press um, poetry chapbook series. It's a wonderful press in the Catskills. And the poems are all kind of along an, a theme about um, invasive species, which I, I see their existence as a response to human uh, intervention, just as extinction is a response to human intervention. And I'm going to read one poem, White Blaze. Okay. A blade of fur along his spine means this boar's forebears were herded onto wooden ships, and the white blaze on his face means his mother escaped a factory farm or made a run for it when some truck spun on ice and slammed to its side, sows frozen to the trailer's metal ribs, shrieks fading as she bombed through the Oklahoma scrub where he was born and raised, upper tusks like wet stones, stropping lower tusks into swords that impale dogs when he's cornered, send their limp bodies flying. Sun high, he wallows in the greasy bank of a cow pond, sets out snuffling for snails, and savors corn seething in its husks. Salamanders are sweet packets of blood, and a fawn carcass steams as he rifles to the bone. Trap smart, he shuns piles of kibble and tunnels beneath the crackle of electric fences. A million of his kind, his mother's side, are dropped twisted in the boiling vat or wag their heads in madness, piglets nursing through bars, his father's progeny gouging pits into golf courses grinding against foam poles, creosote staining the calloused shield of their shoulders, hard drums of their sides, world gutted wide. Um, okay. I'm gonna read uh, three poems from this book, Sober Cooking. Um, I wrote this book during a kind of a hard time my uh, partner's family banned me from her hospital room when she went in. It was really traumatic for me. And my father also died during that time. But I wrote this book and it kind of got me through it. Um, this is the first poem, Incoming Call. After the hand scrawled sign, family only, that blocked me from your room. After I paced outside your life, a starving wolf, lair avalanched shut. After winter, then spring, you called me one night and we spoke, screen to small screen. The voice you'd lost and found was slower, but I drank the sound of it and asked you to angle the phone so I could see your sleeping hand, the arm that would never wake, the outline of long legs, that my legs remember, so I could say goodbye in my way to all the parts of you. This is it. 
Your sternum, where I rested my head those years we shared a bed, has been cracked like a lobster claw, and a jigsaw in the surgeon's hand flicks its razor tongue. Behold the pericardium, milky veil that guards your fist of a heart, finally loosening its grip. Mute themselves. I don't know who that is. Okay. All right, I'm going to start over. Your sternum, where I rested my head those years we shared a bed, has been cracked like a lobster claw, and a jigsaw in the surgeon's hand flicks its razor tongue. Behold the pericardium, milky veil that guards your fist of a heart finally loosening its grip. This morning, in a southern state saturated in sunshine and free of helmet laws, a young man was mangled beyond repair, but his strong heart hunkered down in its cave, was gently pried out like a barnacle, and his gift, in its yellow cushion of fat, was packed in ice, flown north, and rolled with expert haste to the west side of Manhattan, where you sat up in bed dialing the call that buzzed in my backpack. You text me too, this is it. And by nightfall, surgeons stitch the pulsing muscle of a stranger into the cavity of your chest, atrium to atrium, vein to vein, and your blood finds its new hub and passes through. I'm just going to read one more poem from Sober Cooking, um, Flight. Uh, and this is from my father. There are two kinds of people, those afraid of heights and those who imagine jumping. I know which type I am. All my life I watched my father lift off coast and land, a young man in a flight suit rippling with zippers, an old man with white hair sipping coffee in a cockpit, horizon a blistering red line. Dying now in an oxygen mask, he stands, a small boy on the edge of a cliff, surveying the vast, confusing light. He fills his lungs, capillaries pulse like strings of light. He calculates the speed of his own weight falling and stretches out his arms. I take his hand, we leap. So I'm gonna read now um, a couple poems from Tracks. Um, okay. The first one is called Tracks. And I have this clever system with all these little post-its. Um, all right. A woman settles to my left, another to my right. Their padded torsos warm as the cushioned walls of a slaughterhouse ramp. Rush hour can be comforting that way. Few grown women can sit beside each other on the subway's long orange bench without hips pressing together. Men lean forward for shoulder room. The train stalls and out of the silence, a tiny percussive riff leaks from earphones. Someone rifles through a bag of chips. Windows show the tunnels, sooty walls and shapes swirl in that dark palette. I'm standing at the pole and shift my bag to the other shoulder, summon the cheerful voice that had startled me that morning in the half light between sleeping and waking. The schedules of ghosts are more erratic than trains. Even the living stall in dark places, hurtle toward light. I'm poised to dart when the silver doors glide open. Something holds me on track. Um, this is a poem called Scent. S-C-E-N-T. 
They cut her clothes from her, the scissors thick blade nosing beneath her pants cuff, racing up her leg, cold metal leaving its line across her stomach. A paramedic slid the pieces of fabric from beneath her, careful not to jostle while her brain still bled. Later, someone tucked her jeans, blouse, and sandals into a brown paper bag, and I noticed it slumped against the baseboard in our parents' bedroom, put my face into its mouth and breathed my sister's familiar scent, cigarettes, hairspray, cologne, reliving her last day, windows down and hair flying, radio thumping, the roadside rippling with tall grass, one fine apple nestled in her satchel. Um, I'm just gonna read one more from this and then a couple more poems and I'm done. Autism, Children's Ward. My nephew will not be home for Christmas, caught with a shoelace wound around his neck, rope noose dancing from the swing set. Nurses turn their backs when he drops his pants. Puberty, a bully come too soon. Hormones lean as marbles on a slippery floor. He is falling, fighting, his world tipped since birth. Bolts, keys, and batteries lodge deep into radiator ribs, placating his terrible need to hoard. If a school can't educate him, the janitor will. If Medicare box a pain, another hospital lets him go. This time, before he's discharged, I sleep in his bed at home. Relative come to visit, I leave him a note. You have so many good books. I liked Monster Trucks the best. I did not touch your other things. Um, I'm just going to end with a couple new poems. Uh, one is about actually the same nephew. Um, 20 years later, he just passed away the day after Christmas. And it's called Differently Alert. He doesn't make eye contact. The nurse reports of my nephew who is limp with sedation, lips slack, ventilator wheezing on his behalf, inflating his lungs in a rhythm, both amiable and stern. He looks right past me, she says gently. He's probably unaware of his surroundings. We thank her, too polite to point out the monitor's appeal just behind her. Neon green zigzagging across its screen. We don't bring to her attention the splendor of syringe pumps stacked in a tower, the elegant tangle of cables, polished elbows of pipe. My nephew, who took the door off the stove before he could walk, who faked seizures to score an ambulance ride and be rolled into that luminous cavern of tools, stares past the nurse at an alluring silver dial, a corrugated blue tube, and is unbothered at being part machine now himself, almost fitting in. And I'm just gonna end with, um, a, of course, you know, we all have 10,000 pandemic poems. I think it's getting us through it. Um, this one kind of fits in with the other poems that I've read tonight, so I'm going to read that, and this is my last poem. It's um, Social Isolating 17. She chose cowbells, six of them, copper with thick seams, hammered on a forge and tied with a braided blue rag. She looped them on her autistic five-year-old's bedroom door so he wouldn't escape wisp of smoke into the night. He was 12 and she was a few weeks gone when I unhooked the string of cowbells from the door in her empty apartment and hung them on my own door in every apartment I claimed for the next 20 years. I take them out now, each night at seven, shake them on the balcony as my city makes noise in praise of nurses, doctors, and ICU staff who complete their long shifts in rooms crammed with beds and hissing with ventilators. I shake the string of cowbells seven floors up and they clang across the cavern beneath me, loud as a herd of cattle heading at dusk 
for the safest place they know. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much for that great reading. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lynn. <clears throat> Sean Nevin's A House That Falls won the 2005 Slappering Hall Press Chapel Competition. Sean teaches writing at Drew University where he directs the MFA program in poetry and translation. In 2008, he published his first full length book, Oblivio Gate, which was awarded the Crab Orchard Series first book prize in poetry. His honors include a literature fellowship in poetry from the National Endowment for the Arts, the Robinson Jeffers Tor House Prize for Poetry, the Alsop Review Poetry Prize, the Catherine C. Turner Academy of American Poets University Prize, and two fellowships from Arizona Commission on the Arts. During the summer of 2005, I vividly recall sitting beside a lake in the Adirondacks and reading Sean's haunting collection about his grandfather's descent into Alzheimer's. His stunning lyrical poems such as Losing Solomon and Hang Devil Sonnet of the Luna Moth are unforgettable. Poet Denise Duhamel says of his poetry, Sean Nevin understands the paradox of using language to capture its unraveling in heartbreaking poems that chronicle Alzheimer's. He pro probes the power of memory and the tragic beauty of its demise. Let's welcome Sean. Thank you, Margot. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, okay, good. Um, so, so yeah, thank you, Margo, and it's so great to be here again. I'm, I'm always here um, now, <laughs> but uh, be with you guys from Hudson Valley Writers Center again, and um, I will share my screen for a moment too, but this is um, the chapbook, uh, House That Falls, that Margo was referring to, and <clears throat> I also remember distinctly getting the, the call when, when um, I won the contest, and I think Margo and Ann both called me, and I think Ann is, yeah, Ann's here too. Hi, Ann. Um, uh, who both edited this chat book. And if you have not submitted this, or if you have submitted to this conference, to this uh, contest before, keep submitting. It is really, I mean, they just put out such amazing chat books with such care and such attention to every word and the authors. And then they stand behind their authors for so long. I mean, this was, what, 2005? And I'm still here. The community just gets deeper and deeper and stronger and stronger. And I see so many familiar faces here, Suzanne and Susanna and um, Esther. I know I don't see your face because she didn't want to wear pants for this reading, I heard. But um, I know a lot of people are here from that deep community already. And, and um, Jennifer, thank you for just blowing it up, too. I mean, it's getting bigger and stronger as it goes. It really is a literary hub for the East Coast now. So pay attention to the to this center, this community, and support it and join it if you can. All right, so I'll read one poem from the chat book because I've read these so many times. But I'll read the poem that, the first poem in the, in the chat book that um, Margo mentioned, Losing Solomon. And there's an epigraph by Ralph Waldo Emerson. We estimate a man by how much he remembers. Losing Solomon. Things seem to take on a sudden shimmer before vanishing. The polished black loafers he wore yesterday. The reason for climbing the stairs. Even the names of his own children are swallowed like spent stars against the dark vault of memory. Today, the toaster gives up its silver purpose in his hands, becomes a radio, an old Philco blaring a ball game from the 40s with Jackie Robinson squaring up to the plate. For now, it's simple. He thinks he is young again, maybe 19, alone in a kitchen. He is staring through his own reflection in the luster and hoping against hope that Robinson will clear the bases with a ball knocked so far over the stadium wall it becomes a pigeon winging up into the brilliance. And perhaps in one last 
act of alchemy as Jackie sails around third. He will transform everything, even the strange and forgotten face glaring back from the chrome into something familiar, something Solomon could know as his own. Okay, so look for that chapbook contest and submit. It's, it's an amazing contest and it's just an amazing community. Too. <clears throat> okay, so this one I wanted to read. It is um, when I last read at the Hudson Valley Writer Center, I don't remember when exactly it was, with the, I think with Paula and our Drew students, I read a brand new thing um, about dragonflies and the only thing that survived out of it was this image that then came into its own, its own poem. So maybe for uh, Rosemary, I'll show you that, you know, how you can cut away and end up with something you didn't expect. Jesus bugs, it's called. Um, those little water striders that you see on things. And I guess the only thing you need to know maybe is uh, a crucifer shadow um, in processions, religious processions, the people carry the big cross in the front of the crucifers and they leave a shadow sometimes. Jesus bugs, you've seen them twitch and glide in holy processions atop the shallow pocket waters. Like the little boats of lonely rowers that scull along the morning skin of rivers. Such ethereal martyrs, all of them, weightless in the stuttering grace of velocity. The sleek shells of their bodies are fragile vessels, buoyed by limbs so long they malinger, like the awkward oars splayed out from the riggers. The miraculous and gangly water striders bear their burdens in fits and starts, each dragging across the silted bottom a crucifer's shadow. <clears throat> um, Susanna and any other Polish or maybe uh, Slavic people may know cooking cabbage in the house or cooking kapusta, which is a cabbage soup. Um, kind of sneaks up on you in the house, but it does overtake the house for a day or so when people are cooking it. And, People get a little suspicious when they when it first arrives, the smell. Kapusta. First, cleave the wilted globe of head cabbage in half, then shred everything into a brine of sauerkraut with a fatted pork bone and a quick fist of barley. Next, whisk a slurry of white flour into the sauteed onions to thicken the steaming pot already at its boiling point. It will discharge unapologetically an odor that slinks up stairwells and along a dark hallway breaching room by room the unwary house. It may arrive gradually at first, familiar and benign, not unlike the boiling of a frog, or it may arrive as an affront to the senses, vulgar as a slur blurted from a politician's podium, then echoed behind the sawhorse barricades of a police line. Let the smell remind us we are not far from the deep belch and thunder of tanks, burning through a cloud of gunpowder and diesel in a snowbound pine forest in Poland. Let the smell remind us we are not far from the vegetal musk lifting from a Soviet soldier's trench footed leather boot as the red army slogged westward past the, the Pinsk marshlands toward Warsaw. Let the smell remind us that cabbage soup 
like history repeats itself. And that Charlottesville, Charlottesville is not far from Washington DC or those hate rallies in German beer halls where the National Workers Party boiled over like that into brown shirts who kicked in unlocked doors behind which families broke only the buttered heels of their black bread to better sop Kapusta's holy broth up. <clears throat> and this one is uh, new. I'm not sure where it is, where it's, uh, if it's all done yet. I don't think it is, but I know it's not. Actually. But last one I'll read. Magneto reception or magneto reception is I think the way it's pronounced, but it doesn't sound right. Um, Magneto reception is uh, what we're finding more and more about is it's our intuition and animal and insects intuition of how they align along the polar um, along the uh, the poles and they you know either navigate by um, by the by 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 the by the poles by the magnetic poles <clears throat> and they find it in you know salmon bees birds um, dolphin people they think have it as well, you know, it's that intuition of how you do it. Um, so, magneto reception. It turns out, after a multi-year study, that a team of scientists in the Czech Republic have determined that dogs, like the spastic needles of a compass, will jostle and turn their haunches around and round until they align muzzle to rump along the north-south axis of Earth's magnetic field before they drop like a switch of willow branch in the dowser's hand, their hips, and hunker their contorting bodies down the shape of something like a straining question mark to defecate. Holy shit. How did we not know until now this was the reason the neighbor's Portuguese water dog like clockwork spins beneath the jacaranda purpling in the yard? And while we're at it, what about those lab-coated, debt-ridden scientists happy for the work of it? clipboards in hand each morning in the field. Admit it, you like to watch, too, the dogs, dazed in an ecstasy of whirling, like squatting dervishes, the way they zero in on the just mulched flower beds with the single-mindedness of a bombardier sighting in the distant crosshairs of the mind, some subterranean bridge that spans the innate hemisphere of an aquifer, still fluting tunnels into the limestone mantle beneath the ancient ruins of a great desert city to which we all one day will return. In this way, the dogs are not unlike the masters of any serious practice, who, in the evolution of becoming, must first surrender everything fully to the task at hand, to tap into something hidden, vestigial even, but real as a molecule held in the abdomen of a honeybee, mid-twist in a drop of amber formed a millennium ago, or in the branch-worked passages of the sinus cavity of the wild sockeye, nosing back up the brackish waters in which it began. Imagine for a moment MJ, 
Michael Jordan, a master for sure, but first just a kid with quick hands and instinct, a real baller running drills in a dark gymnasium hours before even the buses arrived. He posts up, then pivots, pivot, pivot, release. Again, post, pivot, pivot, release a hundred times until years later in game seven, the rotating ball knows its own geometry from the top of the key and the body turned Pavlovian at the sound of the buzzer will post, spin and release like a homing pigeon, the ball to its hoop. So, thank you guys. So thank you so much to all of you and thank you Margo for these great introductions for um, the three poets and for starting Suffering Hall Press and the Writer Center. Um, we would not be here today, of course, without you. Um, so as Sean said, we have this wonderful annual SHP chapbook competition. So um, if you have not yet written a book or chapbook, um, if you have not yet published a book or chapbook, um, or if your students are um, interested in sending a, ch a chat book to the contest, please tell them uh, to send in by June 15th. Um, and it, are there any questions uh, for the poets? If you would like to um, put your questions in the chat, or if you have a question you would like to ask, you can unmute yourself and direct um, your question to um, one or all of the, of the readers. Uh, Jennifer. Okay, so this yes. question is for Susanna Case. And um, the question is, um, I'd like to know how you came to the title for your new book, um, Dead Shark on the End Train. And if um, the poem that's in your book called Is Your Book Ready for Hollywood um, came before or after? Uh, the uh, Is Your Book Ready for Hollywood came after, but I thought it was kind of a sly thing to do to put the shark in that poem, too, to preview the shark in Dead Shark and the End Train. The, um, the title of the book came from the poem. The poem, the, uh, poem was based on an actual shark on the subway in New York City. We, now we don't have anything in the subway in New York, but that before everything was in the subway uh, in New York, including at one point a shark. <laughs> the, by the way, the shark on the cover, um, it, this is not my doing, this is the publisher's doing, but it is a, uh, is it, it is a, he did, research on what kinds of sharks are off the coast of New York City, and apparently that is a anatomically correct shark. <laughs> Other questions for the poets? Jennifer, I have a question. Great, Paula. Um, did did each of the poets use their chapbook and incorporate that into their next full collection? I didn't do that. Um, I I've been pretty strict with myself about having all pretty much may, except for maybe one poem having all new poems in each book. But um, you know, I, I stand by that early work. You know, I mean, it, it's, it, it was 25 years ago. It seems young to me, but I stand by it, you know, overall. And um, I might include it in a, some of it in a future collection. My, um, uh, the uh, Milk and Cake Press chapbook, Body Falling Sunday Morning, is included in Dead Shark on the End Train but that's very atypical for me. I usually do not do that. The, the, um, the Scottish Cafe collection was never included in a larger book, although 
it did the it did come out in a larger version the um, english polish version that margot mentioned with notes is actually the size because of the two languages is pretty much the size of a uh, of a full length poetry book although it is really just it's the chapbook and the chapbook in another language i'd like to mention that we also had it translated into ukrainian and hope we would, I still think we should try to work on getting it published. In yes, so if right after that was kind of when Ukraine uh, kind, of blew, kind of blew up. So it's, yeah. We're waiting. Yeah. <laughs> and Sean, you, you have poems from a house that falls in the blue yeah. gate, right? Yeah, so, so mine, was, mine was a little different that it, it was kind of the, the, the beating heart of what the collection became um, and, uh, in fact, I was just talking to Rosemary about this, one of my students who's here um, today. Um, but that it, it uh, you know, I thought I'd kind of completed the, the subject matter in the chapbook, but the poems kind of kept coming, whether I wanted them to or not. And it really gave me a focus, you know, of a, a voice and character in the chapbook first. And then um, a lot of poems fell away <laughs> along, along, the, along the, the, the path to this that uh, the more I kept writing, the more I kept realizing they're really involving the same voice, same character, and it just got larger and larger. So this chapbook really worked as like the seed or the, the beating heart to what the larger collection became. Um, and it became more you know, of obsession than intention to expand it or to include it. So it wasn't something I included in it, but it was a sort of beating heart in the, in the, the obsession. So. That was a good question, Paula, thank you. Yeah. Right. Other questions? Question. Suzanne? Yeah, I have a question. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, good, because I can't hear myself. Um, this was a great reading, and I knew it would be, because each of you write poems that are, are both relentless and tender. They are so rich and, and full and troubling and memorable. And I wonder for each of you, um, is there something that happens while you're writing, maybe when you're almost finished with a poem that makes you say, nailed it? Um, my view toward my poems changes from day to day. So I might feel that way a lot of the time right after and then the next day i don't know some spirits come in and rearrange everything and i don't feel that way. so it 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 depends it depends yeah so um for myself you know i it, i it's the kind of the, the jar closing sort of feeling that you don't know it's not a it's not one thing ever that is the same with it but you kind of um, into it when something is done. I think that his laptop may have died, so he'll just have to log back in. Oh, okay. So Lynn and, and Susanna um, can continue an answering that if they have anything else to say, and otherwise we'll go to someone else with another question. Well, you know, I, I hope I'm getting better, you know, over time. I mean, I, I know I'm trying and working hard. So, that what happens is you know you have facility and you have judgment and your judgment sometimes leaps ahead of your facility and then your facility leaps ahead of your judgment and then if you're lucky they align you know sometimes and that's all i'm going to say on the subject <laughs> <laughs> do we have any other questions for the poets i guess i want to ask a question about whether the three of you are finding it more difficult to write now, or you're finding this is a great gift in a certain way to have all this solitude enabling you to spend endless amount of time writing, or how is it working right now in, in uh, the pandemic? It, it's involuntary for me right now. Writing is involuntary for me right now. Wow, so it, that means- It's really helpful. No, it's really helpful. Um, it fills a lot of time and it keeps me grounded in, you know, you know, my poems, you know, they're really grounded in observation. And I find that um, the kind of anxiety and panic that, that this uh, pandemic is making a lot of people feel, and, and, I, and that I feel, 
it abates when I start to observe around the, observe the physical world. And that often starts a poem for me and it helps me um, then go into a, an area that's, that's maybe painful, but um, yeah. So observation is very helpful for me. Yeah. I, I have been out of the apartment exactly once in the last 46 days. So I'm not, the things that I am observing are the things that, um, and that was for a doctor's appointment. So the things that I am observing are <laughs> the things that are, I, I observe a lot. They're not n new things, but I, I, I think for me, uh, I live a lot of my life in my interior and sometimes in other people's interiors, the people who have lived in the past. And so it isn't that much different for me being here in the apartment. Um, I would like to get out, but not so much to service my poetry as to uh, just get out. <laughs> uh, uh, so at the beginning, uh, I would wake up in bed in the morning and think, oh God, it's another day of this. And that lasted a couple of weeks and then I started writing. And so now I think I'm writing pretty much about the same amount as usual. And yes, of course, writing about the pandemic, but trying not, to, at the same time, trying to write about other things too, the things that I usually write about. I, I'd say, of the pandemic poems I've written uh, about a, I've only Lynn's pandemic poems, uh, which I've read, are much way way better than my pandemic poems. No, no, that's I'd, true. I'd, yeah, I'd say of my, I've written about half a dozen pandemic poems, and I'd say, you know, one of them is as yes, as Suzanne said, one of them nailed it, and the others, <laughs> I don't know about the others. <laughs> that may not be my forte. Sean, was there anything else that you wanted to to add to the question you were answering? I don't know where I left off exactly. I wasn't. Un I was unplugged, so yeah. my my laptop died. Sorry. That's okay. Um, so I'm trying to think of what I was saying there. I think um I was saying about closure. Was it or what was it? Yeah. Uh, so the only time oh it nailed it. Yeah, the only time I ever felt like I really nailed it was um at the end of the book, the last word in in the book that I sent off to my, to the late, great, beloved editor and poet, um, John Tribble. Uh, you know, I ended this big seven, seven, 10 page, something like that, uh, long poem at the end of the book that closed the project for me. I thought, you know, for the 50th time, but it was done. And I really felt like I nailed closure somehow. And the last word in the book was um, kaboom. And so the only edits I got back from, from John were, cut kaboom and I thought that was the only thing that really ever had nailed closure for me in something. and I took it out he was absolutely right um you know it was a brilliant thing it was my exuberance not the poems so uh so yeah I never you know I feel like when things click together but not um you know it's never never fully there I think and I'm guessing the second question was when I was gone something about pandemic poems writing those and in one way all my poems are pandemic poems so right. I think that's it. Thank you. So any other last questions <laughs> for the poets? We're really happy to have all of you today. Thank you. Thank you. It was great Thank to you. meet you guys. It's been yeah. such an honor to welcome these three poets back and to see what they've done throughout the years with their career. We're so proud of all of you and we're so thrilled that you're still so much a part of our community. It really means a lot to us.